lot of money is spent on air gun accessories. Why there's regulators, they had cost several hundred dollars and then another several hundred dollars just to have them installed. These regulators make sure that the amount of air is exactly the same or as close to it as possible with each pellet. That allows pellets to go out at say a consistent 800, 850, 900, 950 feet per second. Uh, without those regulators, there's a, a greater variance, 30, 40 feet per second. Uh, and so I see a lot of people buying those. Uh, another thing they do is buy very sophisticated uh, mill dot scopes. Uh, another thing is uh, modulators on the end of the rifles. A lot of them want to put an expensive barrel into these rifles. And I don't have a problem with that. In fact, a lot of my guns have done just that. This Benjamin Armada has not done that. And here's what I want you to know. Uh, because I'm going to walk you through some accuracy tips. The biggest improvement you can get, free, is to improve yourself. To learn how to shoot a rifle, pistol, as accurately as possible. Why, you can take a, a, a group this size and shrink it down to this if you know how to shoot accurate. And then from here, if you want to spend all that money, you can get it even tighter. But let's work on ourselves first. Because if you have a group like this and you don't know how to shoot, you might just get the group down to here with all those accessories and be a very unhappy uh, buyer of air gun accessories. So uh, in the next few minutes, you're gonna see what uh, some accuracy tips that I've learned in competitive shooting that will help you. And Next, I just want to shoot this Armada, which I promise hasn't had a single thing done to it. And we're going to shoot out at uh, 65 yards and hit a frying pan. just like that. Well now it's time to share that accuracy tip with you. And accuracy is important. Accuracy means we hit the bullseye. Accuracy means we hit that critter that was doing damage to your home. Uh, accuracy is important and there's just some good little tips to follow. And one of them today is breathing. A lot of people think what, what in the world does breathing have to do with shooting? And I'll show you. Let's pretend for just a moment that these are the crosshairs on a scope and this is the target. And as you breathe, you will notice that the crosshairs are moving. Even if they're on sandbags, they are moving. And as they move up and down, our first job is to get that vertical line in line with the bull's eye. The second thing is we start to come up with a pattern. Notice here that the crosshairs are going from the top of the bull's eye to the bottom, or at least the black on this target. And as we get it to there, and we're comfortable with this, we come to the point where we're ready to shoot. And we breathe in, and now we let one third of our breath out. And you're going to find that when you let one third out, those crosshairs will come right onto that bullseye. And at this moment, you have three seconds, maybe four seconds, to pull the trigger. And your crosshairs will be right on. If we're using iron sights, of course, these are the two outposts on the back of the rifle. This is the front post on the front of your barrel. And the first thing we want to do is line up the top. We don't want that front post high, we don't want it low. And you'll find the same breathing pattern. And as you get up to the top of your cycle, let out a third, and we come to this position right here. This is called pumpkin on a post. Notice the bullseye 
it is right on that front post and that's where we want the pellet to go. Some people say maybe this is what they meant when they said pumpkin on a post and the answer is no. That pumpkin is the exact size of your pellet, your bullet, whatever and you want it right in here and this is the site that you would be looking for. Another one would be just a red dot scope and all you're seeing is a red dot and as you take in your breath and let out a third you'll come right on to the spot that you want to shoot. Now when I gave my review on the Bulldog 357 I gave you another important accuracy tip then. I said that what you want is in effect to pull the trigger as if you put a pencil in your hand, stuck it in the, pen, in the trigger guard and pull straight back. This is critical because when we just don't think about it, we use our tr trigger finger, it's very easy to pull a pistol or even a rifle to the right if you're right handed. But when we use a pencil like this, the rifle stays straight. I don't mean for us to take pencils out into the field or to the range, though you might give it a try. What we've got to do is develop a whole new skill set and train this finger to do something it's not really designed to do, and that's to come straight in and to pull straight back. And if you think about that, the rifle will stay right on target. If your breathing is right and you let out a third of the breath, it's going to come right on target. That and a nice straight smooth squeeze. And you've got two of my accuracy tips. I think accuracy is probably the most important thing with an air gun. I'd rather be accurate with a bad air gun than inaccurate with a very expensive air rifle. So let's talk about the third most important thing when it comes to accuracy here, something I learned in some competitive practical shooting I've had. But I want you to know that my, my accuracy skills were developed many, many years ago during the war with Vietnam. I was an infantry platoon leader. Accuracy was important. It was important that we shoot the other guy before he shoots us. I was in fact shot three times. I carry a bullet in my left shoulder today as a result of it. They said it was too complicated to get it out. At least back then in the 60s, it was too complicated. But we would get in a firefight in a village and there would be Viet Cong and there would be villagers. As you can see here on some of my side targets, these are hostage targets that are used in uh, practical shooting but we had to miss the good guys and hit the bad guys. We're going to be talking about practical shooting before it's over, but this is how important accuracy can be. Another thing is if you're not accurate, you're going to put that air rifle of yours into the closet and it's going to stay there and rust over the years and you'll never get the value out of it. And after all, they're not cheap. So let's talk about accuracy tip number three. We have a rifle here, forgive me for my poor uh, drawing skills, but this is a rifle. It can be a powder rifle, it can be an air rifle. And above it is a scope or a red dot or even some uh, 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 fixed sights. It really doesn't matter, but let me talk about the scope, the fixed sights, the red dot, because they have two points in them and they're looking right here at 25 yards at this target right at the, at the bullseye. And out 50 yards, they're still looking right at the bullseye. And out here at 75 yards, they're still looking at the bullseye because sights are straight. For miles, they're straight. And yet, the gun doesn't shoot straight. The gun shoots in an arc and that's what these black dots are showing for you uh, uh, an arc and it climbs and it drops air rifles are not too different from this scale I've just drawn here 
because at 25 yards, I often can come right in here and be right at or near bullseye. The sight said that's where it's at and that's where the rifle shoots. But out at 50 yards, I'm still looking at the same bullseye, but that's not where the bullet hits. The bullet hits high. And then, as we get on out further, for me, maybe 75 yards, the bullet drops right back down into the bullseye. We need to understand that. And once we get it, if we're out target practicing or we're out with critter control, and I always have a piece of tape right here on my cheek with these exact dimensions, and uh, I'll write down that it's zeroed in at 25. It's zeroed in at 65, 75, 85. But at 50 yards, it's shooting two inches high. I need to know that when I look into my stock here and know where this thing is going to shoot. Uh, I can leave the gun just where it's at. Unless I'm going to go to a 50 yard match, I might want to just sight it in here. But in this particular case where I'm shooting at a number of targets, live or, or, or paper, I just know that at 50 yards I've got to shoot two inches high. And <laughs> once I understand that, I can get in control of the gun instead of the control of the gun, gun, gun getting control of me. And you get so upset that you put the air rifle into a closet. It rusts up over a dozen years and it's never used again. It's just because you, you, you didn't understand this one piece of, of important information. Okay, we've been discussing how the pellet drops, and we've also been discussing how the wind can blow it. Uh, so let's assume for a moment that we have a 10 mile per hour wind. You know, a lot of people step out into the woods, they're ready to shoot, or their backyard, and I want to practice, and the, the wind's blowing at 10 miles an hour, and they say, well, that affects the pellet way too much. I'll just put the rifle away, and I won't shoot today. The problem is, if we rule out all our windy days for practicing and actually hunting, uh, you're going to miss a huge amount of both experiences. You're going to park that rifle in a closet where it's going to rust up over the next 10 years and you're never going to get the use of it. So actually 10 mile an hour winds, even 20 mile an hour winds, is actually a time to practice and put notes on your cheek piece. You remember my air rifles have some notes on the cheek piece. So I own five or six and I want to make sure that I remember how each one shoots in winds and in distance. So what we're going to say here is that this wind is blowing 10 miles an hour from left to right. And I already talked how it causes the pellet to drift at 25 yards out about an inch, at 50 yards about two inches, and at 75 yards out about three inches at least on one of my rifles. So uh, as this comes uh, happens, what we have here is our scope and we need to learn to make adjustments to hold the crosshairs left or right or high or low to make sure that we can still hit that bullseye and it can be done. Uh, assuming this is the bullseye right here. Now if you haven't bought a scope yet you might want to look at the mill dots. The mill dot scopes are the ones that have these little marks. And for those of us who've done a lot of shooting, these mill dots are very, very important. For example, up here at 25 yards, if the wind is taking my pellet an inch to the right, then I want to aim here. And um, that will be uh, at 25 yards. And maybe I want to aim here, and maybe I want to aim here at 50 and 75. Uh, we talked about uh, the gun shooting right on at 25 and 75, but high at 50. So I can put down here that I want to aim here at 25 or 75. But at 50, 
uh, I've got to aim high so that the pellet comes in low. And uh, so by aiming high, I can put here at 50 yards. And these are for distance, so I have a D, and these are for wind. And by having these marks on your cheek piece, you're in control of your shooting. Now, some of you need to see things to believe it. And let me show you how you might see it. A lot of uh, these shows on YouTube can actually, with their high-speed cameras, show these slugs. And these are the actual bullets you put in a powder cartridge. But we can shoot these out of the same caliber air rifle but now the, the power is air and not gunpowder with a large bang and the smell of nitrate smoke. Every time I smell nitrate smoke from firecrackers or anything, I have flashbacks from Vietnam. Well, how do we get to shoot? And, and, and in some of these uh, other YouTube videos, those high-speed cameras can show that pellet coming out and back in. And the way they do it, is they take some white nail polish and they paint the inside of these pellets. And uh, just a little bit of this will do it. But I find that by painting some of mine, I can actually see the pellet coming and I can see it bending out and kaboom, hit out here. And I can see how that wind is doing its damage. And that helps me understand the process and helps me be a better shot for distance and for wind. The next most important thing I think in uh, air rifle accuracy would be the pellets. And they're made by the zillions in a factory and they're not always made exactly the same. And if we want consistent shooting, consistent placement on a target, consistent grouping, we've got to have consistent pellets. One easy thing would be that cheaper pellets are not so consistent and the more expensive pellets have greater consistency in them. Uh, but let's break it down even greater than that. Often when we have anybody shooting and here comes a hole that's way off from the group, they'll say, oh, there's a flyer. That's an interesting word, a flyer. So one of these pellets just decided to take off on its own and hit the target two or three inches away. We didn't consider maybe it was trigger control, maybe it was our breathing, uh, maybe it was a bad pellet. So we're going to try to get rid of these flyers. First of all, let's kind of take a look at the basic pellets that are out there. These flatheads are referred to as wad cutters or flatheads. And these flatheads uh, leave a nice crisp hole in the target. So for uh, competition shoots, we often have to use wad cutters so that we can clearly see that the holes touch each other, the hole touches a ring line, and we can give you the points. The uh, next one is a hunter. And here's a nice sharp point allowing for good penetration. You know, in, in bow hunting, they, they talk about a pass-through, and that's the highest thing you do with a, with a bow, is get an arrow to go completely through the animal. Why? Because now we have two exit holes for blood. He'll bleed out twice as fast. The animal's life will come to an end much quicker, much more humanely. Well, that would be great with pellet shooting, and this hunter has as good a chance as any. Often, the roundhead or domed pellet. These are very good uh, because they're consistent. And a lot of people will say, this actually is my most consistent shooting pellet. Uh, and then we have the hollow head. And hollow heads are great, particularly with powder guns, because they open up and a 30 caliber becomes a 60 caliber. And that gives more knockdown. But that's because we're shooting at much higher velocities in powder guns. 
I'm not overly sold on hollow heads with air guns that are shooting at 950 feet a second. So I don't really use hollow heads. I've tried them, not that happy with them. Now, the rest, this is called the waist, and this back here is called the skirt. And this is what I want to bring your attention to the most. Here's a pellet, and right there in the back is the skirt. And that skirt, in the manufacturing process, can get bent or banging around in your uh, uh, dresser drawer, wherever, and all of a sudden now, that's not a perfect round circle. And so as this goes down the barrel, it's not capturing the greatest amount of air and uniformity. You'd be surprised if you went through a whole box of these pellets and check these skirts, you'll find that one out of 10, one out of 20, one out of 50 is not round. And that one we want to throw away. We just don't want to use it. So we're looking for nice round skirts. And another thing that ballistics tell us is a great barrel. Now in powder guns, they'll have a bull barrel. And that thing's big and thick with a small hole in it. And that barrel holds true because of its thickness. When we're talking about air rifles, we have thin barrels. We have moderators around them. And uh, there can be some cheap barrels and there can be some very expensive barrels. One of the big accessories is buying a better barrel for your air rifle. I think that that's a possibility, but I want to make sure that I'm being as accurate as I possibly can first. Uh, I think my accuracy tips can take groups like this and bring them down into groups this big. And uh, that's for free. And after we get down to this tight, if you're not happy, now we can go and start buying some of these accessories that will help you make the rifle even greater. But we do need a good barrel that's holding a good round pellet and shooting it down. When these pellets get up over a thousand feet a second, they start doing weird things after they leave the barrel. I've seen them just spiral completely out of control. Some of those uh, uh, aluminum alloy type of uh, pellets that get up to 1500 feet a second, they just go completely out of control. And <laughs> when they hit something, I'm not sure that they have the wallop. They certainly don't have the energy. So we want a good pellet that goes down the barrel straight and stays true on course and hits something and knocks it down well or puts a nice hole in the target. That could be even true whether we're using uh, slug wad cutters or uh, bullet wad cutters. That's what we want to, to accomplish. Good pellets make for good accurate shooting. My next tip on uh, accuracy in air rifles uh, considers the fact that you're pretty good now. You hit the bullseye, you're ready to go hunting. Or some critter's in the backyard tearing it up. And it's time to put that critter out of its misery. So uh, the point is, where do we shoot? We don't see a bullseye on it, and frequently we just try to, to hit it. Uh, I want to make that statement a little more accurate than that. I want you to know exactly where you're supposed to be aiming. <clears throat> now, if you're shooting one of the big bore air rifles, and I'm sorry this isn't a very good deer or elk, but it does get my point across. Uh, when we look at a deer or elk, anything big, I want you to think of a basketball focusing, not focusing, balancing, right on those front two legs. I remember with my wife Paula, we were in the Bighorn Mountains in Wyoming, and we knew some elk were coming up, and we were hiding behind some trees, and I kept saying, uh, just think about a basketball. Don't think about where the heart would be, and the lung would be, and a kidney would be, and all these organs. Just shoot the basketball that's balancing on top of these two legs and these elk came up and I turned around and I whispered to her, 
do you think you can hit the side of a barn? Because that's how big they looked at that time. I remember uh, a deer going over a pass and all I had was a butt shot. But if you think about it, inside the lungs is almost hollow and all the organs are in the front. And this was a monster buck hanging on my walls right now, by the way. And so I took a, a butt shot and went right up, still shooting for the basketball on the front legs, but I'm on the backside. This time, instead of blowing the lungs in or the heart in, I'm blowing them out. He dropped right on the crest of that hill. Often, we don't do head shots with powder guns because we're going to mount the head. We don't want the head messed up from a head shot. So we purposely try to stay away from head shots. But I see a lot of videos on YouTube where they're going for a head shot. They think it's the best, the quickest, that puts the animal out of its misery. And it might. But you know, the slightest amount of wind, the slightest amount of a last minute movement, and we missed it. So here's some targets. And they kind of follow putting a basketball on the front legs except we're really talking about a ping pong ball now. But if we start to think, all I'm doing is really trying to hit a ping pong ball and not a little heart or a little brain or a little this or a little that, it makes hunting a lot more easy. So notice right here above the front legs on this crow. And I gotta tell you, I got a bunch of them where I live and that caw, 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 just is an environmental uh, uh, audio uh, pollution as far as I'm concerned. So I try to take care of them with a shot right above the feet. A uh, squirrel right in here. I don't go so much for the head, but right up from these legs, if he's on all four, right in there I know that I'm going to hit the organs. A rat, boy his head's small, and they come out at night. You're often using night visions, uh, and that's tough. So again, right above the front legs, I put a ping pong ball there, I take him out. This is a prairie dog, but he's very similar to my number one enemy out in my place, and that's a woodchuck. Oh, the damage they do. And here again, right above the front legs, and I get him and I can tell you, it's a killing shot. That shot takes care of the organs, they flip over and they die pretty quick. So I'm using all, all of the uh, sights that I had, uh, whether it's an iron sight shot or uh, breathing with my scope, I'll take out the critters in that fashion.